Hi, my name is Shrey Jain, and I'm a product lead within the Health and Life Sciences team at Microsoft. I'm Eric Horvitz, Microsoft's Chief Scientific Officer. I'm really excited for today's conversation, Eric. We've been talking a lot about the tumor board problem and why it's such an exciting area of work where technology can help interface. But to get us started, can you maybe just describe what the multidisciplinary tumor board problem is and why it's such a high stakes meeting? Well, patients often pose complex challenges where there's not a custom tailored cookie cutter approach to the ideal treatment. It really takes collaboration among multiple experts. There's a great opportunity for bringing rich collaboration as well as having access to late breaking literature on how best to treat cancers for prolonging life, for prolonging well-being, even when, when a patient faces this sometimes terrifying diagnosis. When I was going through my medical training, some of the most interesting meetings for me were tumor board meetings where I was amazed to see an assemblage of the best experts in multiple fields get together. Slides go up. There's the tissue section from the pathologists. The radiation oncologist thinks through how we might hit that tumor with photons or electrons as they talk. The oncologist thinks through different possible treatments. A social worker talks about lifestyle and functionality over time. And then there are even discussions of trade-offs quality adjusted life years. Can this patient live a higher quality life with less invasive treatments, for example? Two reports are critical for figuring out uh, what the headroom is on making a higher quality decision by bringing the best experts together. These kinds of meetings are the most intensive collaborations in the healthcare system, and they often lead to custom tailored treatments, faster time to diagnosis, and monitoring over time and, and readjustment very quickly, given how the cancer is responding to different kinds of therapies. So 20 million patients this year worldwide are gonna be diagnosed with cancer. And some of the medical guidelines like NCCN or ASCO say that about a third of cases belong for review in a tumor board because they're advanced or complex enough. Yet when we look at the numbers for community hospitals in particular, only a fraction of the cases are actually being brought up at the tumor board. Can you go a bit deeper in describing like why is that inequity so present in the community hospitals? Tumor board meetings are intensive. They require the best experts in the world to be at the same place and time, to review a case, to coalesce materials from different specialties. They're not available to everybody. In fact, many cancer patients who would benefit greatly from these deliberations on what's the best treatment for this patient, do not get that kind of custom tailored reflection. Patients uh, and physicians are already challenged with high quality physician time. It's hard to muster the resources to have that be part of a, the ongoing culture for handling all the cancer cases. Even figuring out which cases need a tumor board meeting mm -hmm. or would benefit greatly by having one is a challenging problem. So they wanna deliver the best care possible for patients. Mm -hmm. and. We're trying to lower the bar, make that available to a broader community of cancer patients. So like, why do you feel like technology is uniquely suited to help intervene on some of these problems and challenges with exercising the tumor board meeting itself? And what areas do you feel like technology can help with? We're truly at an inflection point right now in the, the, the power of AI we have today is surprising even the most expert AI researcher. We didn't expect to have these breakthroughs, especially in the prospect for how these might be applied in medicine. Yeah. I mean, these technologies are game changing. They will be game changing for patients in general and game changing, especially for cancer patients. It's so exciting that my wife tells me I don't sleep anymore. <laughs> I love it. Well, I've been on a lot of late it's night true. calls with you. No, but it's true. She's like, why are you? I said, because are you kidding me? Look what's going on right now. What a transformational time we're in. Dre, just thinking about, I mean, we stay up late chatting about this. <laughs> it's one of the first times in history where computation is stepping up to meet the biggest challenges in healthcare with computation, models, information, the ability to weave imagery together with text, genomic information, phenotypic descriptions, reason across specialties, collaborate closely with physicians and patients and their families. When I first experienced the powers of GPT-4, my reaction was that these new models were both a phase transition in possibilities for healthcare, as well as polymathic in some ways. They can reason across specialties 
in almost a magical way. What a great prospect that we could harness these systems with some work and custom tailoring to make them into supportive tools to reduce the costs of hosting tumor board meetings and make them more available to the world. So we both work at Microsoft, an industry technology provider. Why do you feel like Microsoft is uniquely positioned to support in helping with this problem? Microsoft tools and services are ubiquitous in healthcare. They're used for administrative applications, for charting, collecting data, for having collaborative meetings through Teams, for example. Wouldn't it be great to couple the power of machine learning with those tools and harness existing infrastructure already in place uh, and light it up with intelligence and collaborative capabilities? There's been so much talk about how AI can impact cancer care. What's the reality of where we are today with the tools and where we're seeing this interface with clinicians? Let me turn this around to you because you've been working with physicians uh, as the product lead. What do you see? I think there's two broad categories of areas that I see where we're seeing impact today. The first is on the underlying technology where we've actually gotten the model finally to the point where it can speak the different specialties that are needed to operate exactly. in cancer care. That includes radiology, pathology, genomics, and text data from clinical records and so on. And the fact that we can pair the knowledge from these different specialties to these general reasoning models and operate across these different spaces is incredibly valuable. So we've gotten some core competencies we've now been able to demonstrate. But those core competencies are only valuable if we can actually let the clinician use it easily. You gotta interleave it into daily life. Interleave right? it to daily life. I don't want another platform or another app to go to. I already am using too many apps, especially in cancer care where you might have to go to the electronic medical record, the PACS, the LIS system, and get data from all these disparate sources. And if you want to use AI, in addition to your productivity tools, the last thing you want to have is another web app to take all the data, put it there, and get the answer back. And so I think where we're seeing a lot of progress is how you take these AI models and actually embed them into the workplace productivity tools and the systems that the clinicians are already using. And so that's where we are now. And I think we're only starting to see the clinical impact on patients. We're in narrow examples with clinical trials matching, for instance. We're seeing improved matching rates in some of our research we've done with Providence, for instance, or some other areas where we've been able to show pathology imaging models that can really advance the state of how we read you know, pathology slides. And I think there's all these narrow examples, but we haven't yet seen, I think, the culmination of all of that in one place. And that's where I'm excited to take this work. You know, I've been working on AI prototypes in healthcare since the 1980s. And we built decision support tools, for example, that we know were running at the expert levels, yet somehow we, we could not translate them. And what we saw was a challenge in a mismatch between a standalone tool that did great things and the actual workflows, the daily uses, speaking the language of the physicians. And it's taken us years to figure out basically how to start meshing, impedance matching, as an engineer might say, yeah. with clinical care. I think a big disconnect in fabulous demos in healthcare AI to work through what it really means to provide support for decisions at the right time, in the right format, in the flow of what physicians are already doing. We have a really nice body of work in the human AI collaborative literature for how to build complementary systems, how to control initiative, when to lean in as an AI system, when to hold back, when to listen, how to have a problem-solving dialogue. And the dream is to have systems that are like as fluid as a curbside consult. We're limited in our imagination by what we observe in today's practices when these AI tools can be game-changing in terms of the information flows, the assessments, the whole way we do medicine uh, by stepping outside the box of today's practices. Now, of course, we need to be very careful and insightful about meshing with today as we move forward into the future. And that includes, of course, explaining clearly to physicians, bringing them into understanding the analyses, even if it's done in a different language of multimodal reasoning. One way in which we build better models that can reason across these different specialties yes. is 
we continue to follow scaling laws where you get bigger models that just get better at these different tasks, whether that's in pre-training or in post-training. But we're still investing in building domain-specific healthcare models where we're doing pre-training only on medical data. But it feels like in some ways, a path that's being painted is just let the big models keep getting bigger and throw some healthcare data at it. And it's just gonna keep getting better. Is there a more nuanced or richer view of how you think this is gonna move forward for health AI? It's such a great time for the science of machine learning uh, where we're exploring the power of scale, the power of reasoning, the power of controlling models through prompting, through fine tuning. There are big questions. Should I build models that are focused on data sets in specialty areas? Should I instead take a very large generalist model and fine tune it with specialist data and have it light up with the extra acceleration and power you get from the general knowledge around the fine tuned data sets. These are wonderful questions. They're so important to get right. We're learning domain by domain and application by application. And this is one reason I'm really excited about tumor board meetings because now we're actually by very definition going cross specialty. Yeah. These models are just incredible at doing that. We have agent-based systems that can reason across specialties, each playing a different role, and generalist models that can weave things together intrinsically. What a great time to do research in this space and to work with partners to try to make things really work well. The state of where we are right now and what we're proving is that AI agents, agents that have access to these specialized models integrated into clinical workflows that we're really excited about can do a lot of things, but one thing we find is that there's also a lot of noise that they produce. I guess I'm curious from your point of view, you're speaking to a clinician who already has such limited time to prepare for a case. You know, I, the when I speak to oncologists in the United States, they say they only have three minutes per patient in a tumor board review. In the, in the UK, it's even less. It's like under a minute sometimes. And so the prep time they have is also very limited. And if you have all these agents spitting out paragraphs of words as to why they did something, you know, the open question I have for you is how do we get these agents to be truly collaborative with the human to actually make their life easier and not just necessarily spit out the right answer, but the right answer in the right way? You know, we've had a, a stream of research on clinician AI collaboration built on research on human AI collaboration for a number of years. And those methods are still young. They haven't been optimized and brought into clinical practice yet. But the idea is AI systems don't necessarily need to be only be providing information. They can understand their role as a collaborator. They can understand even the, their noise, how to manage what they say and when. There's an interesting analog here in that um, our team looked at GitHub Copilot, a tool for developers. It spits out, generates recommendations on the next piece of code to be looked at. Uh, and it turned out a close examination of the generation showed us that developers were looking very carefully at every recommendation and trying to figure out, does this make sense? Should I use this? And throwing away many of them. But by developing a mechanism using AI itself to control when to show, when to hold back, the AI powered collaborative experience was a lot better. The same is going to apply in healthcare. At Microsoft, one thing we take at a priority as we think about the release of technologies is responsible AI, and it's something I know you have invested heavily in at Microsoft. And when it comes to, you know, myself as a product lead, there's things that are table stakes, you know, HIPAA compliance, security and privacy reviews, evaluations. But I'm curious, from your point of view, as we think about these technologies being integrated more and more into the workflows of these clinicians, what are some new things that we need to be thinking about as we integrate it across the ecosystem? Yeah, I wouldn't call them new things, but certainly what you pointed out are foundations. We can't build systems unless we respect privacy, HIPAA compliance, security, and we evaluate these systems to know what their capabilities are when it comes to sensitivity and specificity when it comes to predictions, for example. However, in the world in where we have AI expertise now, coming into the realm where humans make decisions, we have notions of accountability, responsibility, transparency. Do these systems explain themselves to physicians and to patients well? The prospect of over-relying on these systems, all the biases we've studied in cognitive psychology of anchoring, confirmation, 
come into play. We have to be very careful and build systems with an eye to making sure that they're incredible collaborators, they know about human foibles, and where the responsibility is always on the human clinician. But I wanna to try to fast forward to 10 years from now. What does a day in the life of an oncologist look like when all these tools are integrated into their workflow? Imagine being a cancer patient facing a brand new diagnosis that's life-changing, sitting with your specialists, sitting at a tumor board meeting, with your oncologist, your surgeon, radiation oncologist, the pathologist, and wanting to understand what are the directions, what are the outcomes of different actions that I might take as the patient. And sometimes those preferences involve trading off a longer life for a higher quality life. In fact, patients can assess their trade in terms of qualities, where they basically say, I want the highest expected qualities, which are years adjusted to how much well-being and happiness you'll have over those years, where depending on preferences, you might want a shorter lifespan, but a happier one, or a longer lifespan with some side effects of the therapy. And these kinds of decisions can be helped with these powerful tools that can help identify the ideal decisions based on specific patient preferences. Within 10 years, I'd like to see many more cancers become chronic diseases. We've already had that happen for several cancers. We can do that for many more cancers through AI-enabled advances in the biosciences. I would like to see every cancer patient have the opportunity to have a tumor board meeting, not just one, but an ongoing series because they'll be so efficient and maybe monitored by personalized models that are reasoning about their case where AI systems are dedicated for every patient. We each have our personal oncologist 24 by seven. On the physician side, I can imagine really collaborative systems that understand if, when, and how a patient could use the intellect and touch of the oncologist or the surgeon or the radiation therapist or the social worker, bringing families together with patients and clinical teams so everyone's on the same page. These systems can facilitate uh, this kind of understanding and collaboration. So my bottom line is, I think we can do many things with these technologies. I think we'll be surprised by what we can do. I think the future will be incredible when it comes to advances in treating cancer. I think also though, we'll be surprised with exactly how things roll out. Yeah, I'm really excited for the opportunity to continue working on this with you, but I also wanna highlight, we're not gonna be alone as technology providers no. in solving this problem. We need our collaborators at you know, academic medical centers, providers and pharmaceutical companies to work with us as the domain experts. We learn so much by, yeah. by working in the real world. Lots of surprises when we take a working prototype into a real <laughs> clinical setting. Yeah. And it, success will only come with partnerships like that. Yeah, and this year in May of 2025, we're releasing a first illustration of how the research that's been done at Microsoft Research is translating into tools that cancer care teams can test in tumor boards, which is with our healthcare agent orchestrator. And we're excited for people to, to test and learn more about this. And we wanna partner with them to continue to work towards that vision that you've been highlighting. And I'm sure that those tools will be remarkable and help out a lot, but the feedback we'll get over the next year, two years, three years, that's the critical ingredient for taking this into the real world and more widely. Thank you again for this conversation. It's really been appreciate. fabulous working with you, Shrey. Thank you. If you wanna learn more or collaborate with us at Microsoft to continue to build tools for AI and cancer care, look at our recent healthcare multi-agent orchestrator tool that we launched at Microsoft Build 2025. Read our blog and get in touch. Thank you.